a very warm welcome on this third Sunday of Easter. My name is Hilary Chrisley, and I am the pastor of Glendora United Methodist Church. As we join together now in celebration of the risen Lord who fills our lives with life and joy, may we share in the assurance of his presence with us now and always. If you are a newcomer or a visitor or a longtime participant, we welcome you warmly. May you find here that which feeds your soul. And may you leave our time together with a heart prepared to serve. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let us now join our voices together in our responsive call to worship. We have come from many places to gather in this place, from home and school and work, from next door and from miles away. We have come on foot, by car, bus, and taxi, with friends and alone. Whatever the journey has held so far, Wherever we find ourselves in our faith or life, God calls us together. Now, to see what God has done and to follow wherever God leads us next. And so we join our voices with voices past, present, and future to worship God together.
will fight life's fight no more with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, we'll see the lights of glory and we'll know He reigns. Because He Hear now these words from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 14a, and verses 36 through 41. Peter stood with the other eleven apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. Therefore, let all Israel know beyond question that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the crowd heard this, they were deeply troubled. They said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Change your hearts and lives. Each of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, your children, and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God invites. With many other words he testified to them and encouraged them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Those who accepted Peter's message were baptized. God brought about 3,000 people into the community on that day. Our gracious God fills the earth with good things and invites us to share freely in the blessings of life. By sharing our gifts with others, we proclaim God's grace. We intend the offerings we present to be a sign of the abundant life God intends for all people. And so we share all of our gifts together in Jesus' name. For those who are vulnerable, we offer our strength. For those who seek a witness, we offer our vulnerability. For those who are forgotten, we offer our voice. For those who have been silenced, we offer our listening. For those who live in daily need, we offer what we have. For those who have too much, we offer a path through the eye of the needle. To the demands of all false gods, we offer resistance. To the one who gives us life, who has ended death's dominion, and who sanctifies us in the spirit, we offer our lives. Amen. Our gospel lesson today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 25. 
On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place there over the last few days? He said to them, what things? They said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago. But there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women said. They didn't see him. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people. Your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going on ahead, but they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? They got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying to each other, The Lord really has risen. He appeared to Simon. Then the two disciples described what had happened along the road and how Jesus had been made known to them as he broke the bread. A woman at the airport waiting to catch her flight bought herself a bottle of water, a bag of cookies, settled into a chair with her things all around her in the airport seating area and began to read a book. Suddenly she noticed that the man beside her 
he was helping himself to the cookies from the cookie bag on the seat between them. Now, not wanting to make a scene, she read on, she ate her cookies, drank, drank her water, watched the clock. And as the daring cookie thief kept on eating the cookies, she got more irritated but said nothing. With each cookie she took, he took one too. And when suddenly one cookie was left, she wondered what he would do. So the, then with a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie, broke it in half. He offered her half and he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh brother, this guy has some nerve and he's so rude. He didn't even show any gratitude for the cookies. She sighed with relief when her flight was called. She gathered up her belongings, headed for the gate, refusing to look at that ungrateful thief. She boarded her plane, sank into her seat, reached into her baggage, fetched her book, and what she saw made her gasp with surprise, for there in front of her eyes was her unopened bag of cookies. Two people, one bag of cookies, reminds us that sometimes we're confused and it's hard to tell what belongs to whom. Two other people found themselves with the same confusion. It had been just three days after the crucifixion. The holy days were over and those who traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover were making their way home. For the followers of Jesus, it had been a Passover like no other. Jesus had entered the city to the hosannas of the crowd. He had celebrated the holy days, had given them a new commandment to love one another as he had loved them. Then, in a whirlwind of events, Jesus is tried and tortured and crucified. But the Messiah didn't rise to a mighty forceful power during the Passover celebrations. The one in whom they had placed their hope was executed. He was buried in Jerusalem, away from home, away from family, and their hopes had been buried with him. To add to the drama of the last few days, there, there are rumors circulating. He was never actually buried, you know. He was buried, but his body had been taken. So much has happened. So much chaos, confusion, disappointment. And so two of his followers found themselves walking home. They walk home to Emmaus, about 10 miles from all the Jerusalem events. And along the way, they're replaying those events over and over, trying to make sense of it all. We, we don't know too much about these two. We, we know one by name, and we know they are followers of Jesus and had hoped he'd be the promised one who would save Israel. They aren't described as leaders or one of the 12 disciples. They're kind of like us, everyday followers of Jesus. And they walk and they talk, and they find themselves accompanied by a fellow pilgrim leaving Jerusalem. Their fellow traveler asks them what they're talking about and they're incredulous. Weren't you just in Jerusalem? Don't you know what's going on? What do you mean? The stranger asks. And they tell him what they know by heart. Jesus of Nazareth was a prophet of God. Our chief priests and leaders charged him and brought him to be prosecuted. He was condemned and crucified. And not only that, now some of his of his followers are telling unbelievable stories about his tomb being empty and his body gone and one even said an angel told her that Jesus was alive. Now the traveling companion doesn't seem surprised by this news at all. In fact he begins to walk them through the scriptures, the stories about Moses and the prophets. He shows them a thread running through it all of how God has taken the initiative to save humanity. He tells of how God's word was rebuffed time and time again, including the time when the word was made flesh and dwelt on earth. Now all this time, the two don't know the identity of their companion, but they know their duty to a stranger. And these two arrive home. And even though the stranger seems to be going on further, they invite him to join them, to rest and eat, continue the discussion, and they share the hospitality of home and food. They all freshen up from the journey and come to the table. And then the guest does something rather odd. He takes place at the head of the table. 
says the prayer of blessing, breaks the bread, gives it to them. And in that moment, the two followers perceive that their companion on the road all along has been Jesus Christ himself. The Lord is here in their home, breaking the bread, and then, and then Jesus is gone. Amazement, realization, excitement. The two go back to Jerusalem, walking, I would imagine, at a much swifter pace than before. And they find the others and tell them the news that they had seen the Lord. He broke the bread, and in that moment, they know it is Jesus. The very same Jesus, the very same Jesus who ate with sinners, the same Jesus who fed thousands with a few loaves and some fish. This same Jesus, by the power of God, has been raised from the dead. They follow Jesus Christ, and now they follow the risen Lord. They follow the word of God made flesh, the word of God that has conquered death. The guest in their Emmaus home, well, the guest had been Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. And they had shared conversation, they shared their home with Jesus, only to discover that they are confused about what belongs to whom. Here they thought they are being generous and hospitable, inviting him in and offering him the front room and the dining room, offering a place to rest, only to watch their guest transform before their eyes. The guest is not a guest after all. He is the head of the table. He is the host of the meal. Hmm. This is a very helpful story for people like us who get confused about what belongs to whom. We get confused about who is the host and who is the guest. We get confused about who is extending the invitation. You see, we feel very open and spiritual when we ask Jesus to help us with a problem. We feel very holy when we make room for God at our meals by saying grace. We feel as though we've invited him into our homes when we put the family Bible on the coffee table. Uh, but this is where we're a bit confused. If the Jesus we follow, the Jesus we believe and obey, the Jesus who died and rose from the dead is the Jesus who is risen and the Lord of life, how can we get confused about what belongs to whom? It's not our meal. It's not our house, our coffee table. It's not even our Bible. It's not our table to be inviting Christ to. It all belongs to the Lord of life. We are the stewards of our homes and our Bibles and our lives. It is Christ who offers us a meal, a home, belonging, new life. It is Christ who invites us to take and eat. It is Christ who invites us to come and follow. It is Christ who invites us to dwell and abide in him. Our lives belong to Christ. We are already his. That's, that's the basis of our celebration of baptism. And as we remember our baptisms and are thankful. Baptism is our recognition of Christ as the host, the Lord of life. It is a recognition that our lives, our children's lives, don't belong to us. From the beginning, we already belong to God. And baptism is a visible outward sign of God's love for us even before we realize it. It is in baptism that we can have a lucid moment in which we can see clearly who belongs to whom. Baptism and communion are two sacraments we celebrate to show how God is revealed in everyday elements of water, in the cup and in the bread, how God's unconditional love invites us to the baptismal font, to the communion table, to Christian community, to life with the risen Lord. We are thankful for such holy moments when we can see with clarity the love of God shining through, calling, claiming, inviting us to new life. Easter brings us this opportunity, the opportunity to respond to Christ's invitation to you. Christ's invitation to belong to the body of Christ. Christ's invitation to be with one another. Christ's invitation to be a part of something larger than ourselves, to be the presence of the risen Christ in the world today. If you are a member of the body of Christ, we invite you to renew that commitment today. If you've not yet shared your, 
your acceptance of Jesus' invitation of a new life and community, we encourage you to do so today. You may never have actually told Jesus Christ that you would like to be one of his followers. Maybe you're in need of his forgiveness and grace today. Maybe you would like to be made whole. The first step in the Christian life is simply to acknowledge your desire to belong to Christ and your acceptance of what he has already done for you. If you would like to take that step today, to commit your life to him, to recommit your faith in him, join me in saying this prayer. You may use your own words or say along with me, Dear Lord, I would like to be one of your disciples. I would like to follow you. I accept the forgiveness and mercy you offer me. Make me new. Help me to follow you as I commit myself to you. I pray this to you and in your name, Jesus. Amen. Friends, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hello, my name is Karen Bioto, and I serve as church council chairman. I wanted to speak to you about the, the Sabbath. Sabbath, as we know, is the seventh day, the day of rest, the day of being away from work and concentrating on God. You know, Jesus took time away from his ministry, from his disciples, and spent time alone praying and listening to God and knowing what God's will for him was and knowing that he would return and do God's will. Pastor is taking a Sabbath break, but over the last eight years, she has taught us many lessons about God's will, God's amazing love for us, God's ability to sustain us. And now, with those lessons learned, we are going to grant Pastor Hillary a time of learning, reflection, and just being. God bless you, Pastor. We wish God speed to Pastor Hillary as she begins her spiritual formation leave for these next three months. As you journey, God dwell with you while we are away from one another. God's blessings on you all while I'm gone from you. God fill you with the Holy Spirit as you rest, pray, and play. I thank God for the ministry we share and the gift of this time away. We pray that you experience the gift of spiritual growth in your journey and that you return renewed and energized for ministry. I pray that you too might be renewed and energized as you continue to serve in God's name. We send you with our blessing. God's peace be with you all. Let us pray. Spirit of God, bless Pastor Hillary during her leave time. Renew her for ministry through this time set aside for reflection and study, the refreshment of a break from daily tasks and routine, and the excitement of new learning and direction. Grace us all with your presence and keep us steadfast in the faith while we are gone from one another. Amen. Amen. Please join me in our Easter renewal affirmation. When we look into the horizon and try to picture where we want to go, God is beside us on the path. We are not alone, and though it sometimes feels that way, God is beside us on the path. When we have dreams and nightmares about where we will end up, God is beside us on the path. When we've been given so much advice that we wind up even more confused, 
God is beside us on the path. We want the right school and the right job. God is beside us on the path. When we are worried about money, God is beside us on the path. When we have problems with our memory, God is beside us on the path. God will walk with us. God is beside us on the path. God will carry us when we are tired. God is beside us on the path. We are servants of God. God is beside us on the path. God would never have us make decisions alone. God is beside us on the path. All things are possible. God is beside us on the path. Amen. Go now, friends, go into every day, knowing the love that the Creator has for you since before in the beginning. Go knowing of the invitation Christ extends to you every day to be a follower of Christ. Go with the Holy Spirit's power for this new life to fill you over and abundantly to share with others the great good news that we serve a risen Savior. Amen. <laughs>